How many of you, can I ask you a few questions, how many of you would like 2013 to be the most effective and prosperous and anointed year that you've had? How many of you, how many of you believe that that can be? Amen. Well, let me say this to you. There's some things, there's some prerequisites to having God's blessings flow big in our life. I said there's some prerequisites to having the anointing of God to flow big in our life. <clears throat> in fact, Deuteronomy 28 says, 28 says, if you'll keep my commandments, if you'll walk in my statutes and my ways. In other words, that's a prerequisite. Amen? If you do something, God will do his part. You see, many times we want God to do his part, but we forget about what our part is. Is that right? I'm going to give you some serious instructions this morning, and you'll know why as we get into this, how important it is for us to do our part. I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about stewardship, I'm going to talk about giving, and I'm going to talk about the tithe. Now, I've already lost some of you. Pastor, can't you tell me that I'm just going to have the joy? Can't you tell me just everything that I lay my hands to will prosper? Well, let me tell you, there are some prerequisites to obedience to God that will bring the end result. And see, I think it's important for us to look at those things. The day that Mickey and I have started prospering is the day that we started believing that God's word is true as far as the tithe and giving and offerings is concerned. There's a lot of folks that will tell you all about it, but when it comes down to doing it, it's a different story. Uh, we need to sometimes uh, redefine what the word needs mean. We live in a selfish generation. We live in a time where we want our needs met instantly. We're instant people. We don't want to wait. We don't want to wait for God to bring forth uh, the best. We just want to get it done now. Meet my needs. It's a need or a want society that we live in are you with me church give it to me now make sure that I get my knees met now and some of us older generation might be at blame but we've taught that to our children because after all many of us know what it's like to go through the depression many of us know what it's like to go through the the, tight, the tough years in the 50s many of us know what it's like uh, to do without a lot, a lot of things and still be happy and we don't want our children to have to go through that so we've given them all kinds of stuff and now they have no idea what it means to be satisfied because they want what they want Thank you for that one, amen. <laughs> we need to refine our, uh, redefine our, our uh, evaluation or our definition of needs. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, it says, but the, tree of good and, but the tree of knowledge and good and evil ye shall not eat, uh, for in the day that ye eat of it, it shall surely die. See, God has always had a remnant or God has always had a particular thing that he considered his. Are you with me? Even in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve could have anything they want, but there was one thing. I, I look at it as the tithe of God. I look at it, what belonged to God. And God said, this belongs to me. And if it belongs to me, it's going to be blessed in my hands. But if you take it and use it for yourself, it's going to be cursed in your hand. Is anybody with me so far? Now listen good, because I believe that the Spirit of God has, has, has spoke to me about trying to bring the level of this congregation up to a place where you're going to be blessed this coming year in a tremendous way. It's time for us to walk in the blessing. But then it's time for us to be obedient to the Word. And those two things have to flow together. And so stewardship, what does the word stewardship mean? I'm glad you asked. Stewardship means, it, 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 it means that it's to manage something that belongs to someone else. Stewardship is having the, having the wherewithal and the trust to manage something that belongs to somebody else. We're a manager of what God puts in our hands. Amen? So that means that everything that God has, everything belongs to him. How many of you will agree with that? The Bible says all the silver and gold is mine. 
all the cattle on a thousand hills. God created everything. It's all his. So why do we get so haughty about what God gives us and we, uh, and, and we get so possessive about it that we can't let it go when it's, the very, when it's the very essence of releasing the anointing and the presence of God back into our life because as we uh, give, then God can open up the windows of heaven. And it seems like in this day that we live, uh, you, if you study statistics, and I have a little bit, a study of the fact that tithes and offerings in churches have dropped down. Uh, people uh, used to be 20 years ago uh, that the, uh, that the average, church, average church, 20% of the people tithed. Tithe, and we're going to get into that, is 10%. Or first fruits, one the same. And so uh, we recognize that, uh, uh, that uh, people used to give 20%. Everybody knew that in the church, Pastor Bill. We always said how many people tithe, the 20% of the people were tithers that carry 90% of the load, right? You know what it is now? 12%. The, the, the latest statistic that I searched yesterday, 12% of charismatic uh, Pentecostal people, 12% actually give a tithe. That means a 10%. How many of you know a tithe is not uh, a, a couple dollars a week? A tithe is not uh, just a general offering. A tithe, uh, a tithe is not an offering. A tithe is the portion that God requires back to him uh, that, uh, that he said it belongs to him. And if we'll give it to him, uh, we'll find ourselves walking under the blessings of God. In Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18 and 20, it says, Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God Most High. And blessed be the God of Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him tithe of all. The tithe started, someone says, well, well the tithe goes back to Israel. Tithe started before the Israelites. Tithe didn't start because God chose a, a group of people and called them his chosen ones, the apple of his eye, uh, Israel. And tithe was before that. Then in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 9, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I gave you, and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheave of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. The tithe is the first fruits. The first fruits, that means that what comes off the top is the tithe. And I want to see this church blessed back and come back under the blessings of God in a tremendous way, even in a time of tight finances, even a time of recession, even in a time when, when it seems like people really aren't sure what the finances of the country's doing. Who cares? We don't live under that, we don't live under that philosophy. Church, I don't live under the, uh, under the philosophy uh, of, the, uh, of the world system. I live under the philosophy of God's financial plan. A God is bigger than enough. A God that moves in the midst of all circumstances. He doesn't get blocked or doesn't get nervous or doesn't stop because the gas is going up. Is anybody with me? Why is that? Because he's the God that created all the stuff. He's the God uh, that made everything happen. He's the God that laid the rules and the plans down. Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 22. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that's in the field produce year by year. I'm giving you some scriptures. There's many, many of them. I'm not going to give you all the scriptures I have on what the Bible says about tithing, but I'm just going to give you enough to let you know that God has a plan for us, and if we'll operate in the plan, you'll find yourself elevating yourself to the next level of God's victory, God's financial abundance, and walking in more than enough. It's time the church isn't beggary and we're not walking around broke and we're not in the same condition of the world because we live to, a different, we live to different principles. We'd walk to a different set of rules, if you will. Everybody knows Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8. Will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? That's what God asked ask Israel. Will a man rob God? Evidently the answer is yes. Somebody must rob God or he would have never said, will you rob me? Amen? God wouldn't say, would a man rob God if nobody was robbing God? So he asked the question, would a man rob God? 
Yet you've robbed me. That's the next, that's the next word. Yet you have. Yes, yes, yes. You have robbed me. He's talking to, to Israel. He's talking to his chosen people. He's talking to the ones he loved. He's talking to the ones he wants to bless. He's talking to the ones he wants to prosper. Amen. So, so could we ask ourselves that question? Would a man rob God? Don't answer it. The scripture always does. Uh, yet you have robbed me. But then you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings. Well, money isn't everything, Pastor. Well, I'll tell you what, it's important to God because it tells God where our heart is. You see, if God can get in your wallet, he can get your heart. If he gets your heart, he'll get in your wallet. If he gets your heart, he's going to get you to release and open up. Because, uh, because of the fact that uh, where your treasure is, where your treasure, uh, where your treasure is, uh, that's where your heart is. Is anybody with me? And you see, I really firmly believe, church, and I said this Thursday night, I firmly believe that God's original plan was not that the people of the world, especially the people in the church, operate under government subsidies, operate under a government program, that the government will supply needs for us because we can't have our needs met? No, the original plan was the church would have abundance of finances to meet the needs of their people. And why don't we? Because only 12% people tithe. But what would happen if the whole church world would all of a sudden catch the vision of blessings of God and the anointing of God and start giving according to Scripture? What would happen? The church would be able to, be able to have so much to meet needs, to meet jobs, to help people start businesses, that the church would prosper in such a tremendous way that the world would say, God truly reigns in the house of God. And in what way have we robbed you? First of all, God establishes what a man robbed God. Second, he says, he says, yes, you have robbed me. And now he says, in what manner? What manner have, Lord, have we robbed you is the response. And he said, in tithes and offerings. And then here's another important thing. Listen. When we rob God, guess what happens? We're cursed with a curse. Why? Because you've robbed me, God said, even the whole nation. The whole nation was cursed because they were holding back and taking what belonged to God, spending it for themselves, and not giving God what portion was his, and God says it was a curse. Why is that? Because that 10%, that tithe, that tithe is blessed in the hands of God, but cursed in the hands of man. Because it don't belong to us. God says, I'll give you 90% of what belongs to him. He'll give it to us so we can do what we want to and we can, we can share and we can bless and we can minister. But God says there's a certain part, that's the tithe, the 10%, that I want to be called mine. And if you give it to me, the windows of heaven will open and you'll walk under an open window of God's anointing and God's presence. And then in Malachi 3 verse 10 says, try me now. It's the only place I find in scripture that God says, test me. It's the only place I find where God says, try me out and see if I won't. Test me and see if I won't. Mickey and I, when Mickey got saved and, 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 and well, we decided we were going to establish our life under the principles of God and, and she had four children and I had one and well, all of a sudden we had a family, five children and, 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 a, and, and we, I knew before we even got started that we was going to be in the church. We was going to serve God. I said, if you're going to marry me, you're going to have to get saved. She got saved from what? She thought maybe saved from drowning her, you know. <laughs> saved from what? I said, saved from, uh, from uh, losing out on eternal life. I want you to have Jesus in your life. And I told her about the plan of salvation. And we started going to church. And, and God moved. And she gave her heart to the Lord. And got saved. And then got filled with the Holy Ghost. And the power of God was moving in our life. It wasn't too long, maybe six, six months or something after that. I said, honey, I believe in tithing. She said, you believe in what? I said, tithing. She said, what is that? I said, that's giving God 10% of all that we have. Well, I'll tell you what, this gal, she's, she's a financial guru. I mean, she knows every penny that comes along. I mean, she watches stuff, you know. I mean, I said, I'm glad of that. I probably wouldn't have nothing that wouldn't be for her. 
And she said, 10%? Are you kidding me? I said, no, I'm not kidding, honey. I'm serious about this. I said, I, 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 said, I realize that if you give to God his portion, that God will keep, always keep you flowing. She says, well, it doesn't make any sense to me. We can't hardly, we can't hardly make it now. We got a family of seven. We got, we got five children. And hey, you're working a day and night. And, and she was working out of, out of the home uh, as, as a tax consultant and, a, and, and uh, a tax preparer. And we just hardly could make it. And she said, you mean to tell me that we're now we're going to give 10% of what's already tight to give away? Way. She said, at the end, when I figure out all the bills, there's not enough. I said, I understand that. I said, don't figure out all the bills and then tithe. I said, here's first fruits. You tithe first and there will always be enough to tithe. I said, there will always be enough. The first fruits, that's first. That means first fruits means first. Amen. Has anybody else figured out any other way? First fruits means First. Amen. And so uh, she started, uh, she, she, she just trusted me and she wasn't real happy about it, uh, but she did it anyway. And I said, honey, I'll tell you what, let's test God and see if he won't. Let's try God and see if he won't. Uh, if he won't at the end of the month that you have enough to pay all the bills. Sure enough, we started tithing and at the end of the month and at the end of that month, the end of the next month, the end of the next month, and she came to me and says, honey, I don't know how this is working out. I, it doesn't make any sense to me, but there's always enough money to pay all of our bills since we've been tithing. Come on, somebody ought to get happy about that. I believe that's the key. I believe tithing is the key. It's the key uh, to financial success. It's the key to prospering. It's the key uh, to walking in the peace of mind in your heart. It's the key to blessing other people. You know, God doesn't bless you just to sit around and, and, and fill up your barns and build bigger barns and have your ease. God's blessed you that we can be a channel, a conduit, that we can reach out and touch other people and touch their lives uh, with uh, not just financial blessing, uh, but touch their lives with any possible way that we can to help somebody's life. We ought to honor one another. Is anybody with me so far this morning? Romans chapter 11 and verse 16. And someone says, give me some New Testament scriptures. Romans chapter 11. For if the first fruit is holy... The lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. The first fruit is the tithe. The first fruit we ought to give to the Lord. Church, listen. I'm not trying to get on to anybody. I'm not trying to put anybody under pressure. You know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to position you for the blessings of God to move up mightier in your life. If something's working, my goodness, I wish somebody would tell me about it. If someone's getting blessed coming in and going out and great things are happening in their life, I want to get next to them, rub against them a little bit and say, come on, rub it on me. I want to know what's happening and what's causing you to be blessed. And we live in a society where the finances are, are so prevalent in people's mind, they're backing down on giving to God. This is the time to release and let go. The church is going to be tested here, here, here this, at the beginning of this year because there's, be there's going to be people that are going to be paying more taxes than they did before. Am I right? I mean, Esmond shared that with me. So what are we going to do? Are we going to tighten up? Are we going to back down on our giving to God? Or are we going to say, God, uh, you are the God of more than enough. I trust you. I'm going to continue to give. Uh, whether I have a little lack here, a little lack there, you're the God of increase. You'll bring increase into my life, and this is the time to trust him. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, I want this church to prosper. When I say prosper, I don't mean having, uh, having uh, another big car in the garage and another big house somewhere. Prosper means uh, to have enough that you can uh, that your needs are met and you can bless somebody else. That's what prospering is. I want us to have enough that we can touch somebody's life. I want us to have enough uh, that we can minister to people. I want us to have enough that God, the anointing of God can flow through you at any given time. The Bible's full of the things that releases releases the blessings of God. Well, Pastor, isn't there, isn't there more than just financial blessing? Yeah, uh, but that shows the heart, of, uh, the heart of the man towards God. Whenever, uh, whenever, we're, uh, whenever our treasure is released to God, we'll release the other things. The tithe means the tenth. It means the first fruits. 
In fact, in Matthew 23 and verse 23, you can check it out later, but Matthew 23, 23, it says that Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees as he sat at the treasury watching people give, that Jesus said this. It must have been important to him because he was watching those to give. That's when he saw uh, the, uh, the, uh, the widow's might, the woman with the widow's might that gave all that she had when she gave two pennies uh, to the work of the ministry. But it says, for you paid tithe and that you ought to do. Matthew 23, 23. Uh, that you paid tithe and that you ought to do, but there's these other things and it was about attitude uh, that he said, hey, you're not doing. But the tithe was an important thing. The tithes means the tenths or the first fruits. There's three kind of people in the church today. Can I tell you who they are? Is anybody still with me this morning? I'm trying to help you. I said I'm trying to help you. I want you to bring, up, bring you to the point where, uh, where, where you understand uh, that reaching you, that giving to God releases the very anointing in every area of your life. There's three kind of people in church today. That number one, those that don't tithe. Number two, there's those that tithe from time to time when they think about it or when they can or think they can. Number three, there's those that tithe on all of God's giving in their life. Everything that comes in, they tithe on it. Everything that comes along, they say, Lord, this portion belongs to you. And when we do that, the blessings will flow as you can't outgive God. How many of you believe you can't outgive God? Amen. God is more than enough. He's abundant. He'll give you all that you need. There's some things that the tithe will do. Number one, the tithe can, 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 will cause blessings in your life. I said the tithe will bring blessings in your life. How's that? Uh, but Malachi said, if you'll give tithes and offerings and you don't rob, rob God, I will open up the windows of heaven. I will pour blessings upon you that you can't contain. It brings blessings in your life. The, number, the second thing that a tithe will do, it'll bring some challenges in your life. Am I right? I told you some challenges that Mickey and I had when we first got, uh, got married. She didn't think that, that it was necessary, and I, I, I was convinced it was. I said, let's just test God, and we tested God, and God proved himself, didn't he, sweetheart? Now you know who's the big pusher for tithe in my family now? This lady right here. I mean, it's turned around for sure. I mean, she ties on everything. You know, if she gets a coupon, she wants to tithe on it. She's a tither. And boy, I tell you, I'm glad because it just releases the anointing of God. We're blessed coming in, blessed going out. Uh, God meets our needs all the time. He's met our need from the very day we started this ministry. God has always met our need. You mean there hasn't been some tight times? Yes, there has. There hasn't been some times that we wondered uh, what's gonna happen? Yes, but we trusted God because he always sees us through. Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap if he's been blessing you and you know he's a God of more than enough. The tithe can be a challenge. It can be a challenge to, to sometimes figure your bills out and say, there's not enough. It can be a challenge to sometimes say, by faith, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay my tithe and I'm going to believe God at the end that, that, that he's going that, that to be able to supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. But I'll tell you, he'll do it. I said he'll do it. And then the third thing that the tithe, it can be a curse. According to Malachi chapter 3, it can be a curse. When you use what belongs to God, it's cursed in your hand. When you let God use what's his, it's a blessing. And I want every person here to be blessed. I want you to be blessed coming in and blessed going out and blessed in the city and blessed in the country. I want you to know what it's like to walk under the umbrella or the covering of God's blessing under an open window where the, uh, where the glory falls out and the power of God moves in your life. We're into a new year. This is a, this is a time to do it. This is the time to refocus. This is the time for some of us to make decisions and say, you know, Pastor, uh, I'm, I'm going to test this thing. I'm going to find out if you're right. I'm not going to be a statistic of one of those uh, people that only 12% are carrying the 90% uh, the, the, the load of the church. I'm going to be a tither, and I'm going to watch God bless me as I bless the body of Christ. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, and the Lord said to Joshua, I love the book of Joshua. You want to read an exciting book, get over there and read how God uh, started out by saying to Joshua, uh, Joshua, uh, my servant Moses is dead. 
It's time for you to gird up and, and time to be courageous and be strong. It's time whatever you put your feet to, whatever you put your feet on, it's going, it's going to be given unto you. I'll anoint you and I'll, I'll bring you to the place. You'll be the, you'll be the one that will fulfill the goal and the vision that I gave Moses to fulfill. And Joshua, the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given you Jericho into your hands. The king and the mighty men of valor, I've given you a city. The very first city that Joshua went after he crossed the river of Jordan and going into the Canaan land, the land that God provided. How many of you know God will provide some things for you, but sometimes you've got to tear down the enemy and, and, take, and you've got to take it by force. Amen? Pastor Bill, God has given you some incredible things, but you've had to go in there and clean the land. You've had to go and chase the enemies out. And you had to go and do warfare. And so have we right here. But I'll tell you what, it, 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 Joshua was given the anointing. In fact, when the spies went in to spy out the land, if you remember, 12 spies went in, spied out the land. And Rahab the harlot let them stay in her place, and she, uh, and she let them down over the wall so they wouldn't get, uh, so they wouldn't get caught. And, and this is what Rahab said. She said uh, that the word is out uh, to, to, to the spies. The word is out that your God is the God of enough. Uh, we know all about your God that opened up the Red Sea. We know all about the God that provided uh, victory for your people. We know about the uh, drowning uh, of, uh, of the Egyptian soldiers. Uh, we know your God. In fact, our people tremble when they think about your God. There was no, uh, there was no reason for them to be afraid. But yet you know the rest of the story. They came back and Joshua and Caleb said, let's go take the land. The other 10 spies says, no, there's grass, there's giants in there. We're like grasshoppers next to them. No, we'll be defeated. We can't take the land. And because of their lack of faith and unbelief, they spent 40 more years in the wilderness. But Joshua goes in and after the anointing of God's on him and he goes and he goes into battle against Jericho. You know the story. We sing the songs. Walk around the walls of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Jericho. But God said this. God said don't take nothing out of Jericho. Don't take gold. Don't take silver. Don't take nothing. Go walk around the walls. The walls will come down. Destroy everything in Jericho and come out of there. And, and why is that? Because Jericho was a tithe. That was the tenth. But that was the 10% of all the rest of the cities in, in Canaan that they was going to have to go after. And God said, this is mine. This belongs to me. It was the first fruits of the first battle to be won. And there was a man called Achan that went in there. He was one of Joshua's mighty men. And when he went in to take the, uh, whenever the walls came down, he, they went in uh, to defeat the land. He found some gold and he found some silver and he, and he got him a sack and he put gold in and everything and, and, and brought it back and hid it under his tent. And it wasn't long after that they had another battle and that battle was against the next little city called Ai. And they went to battle against Ai. And as, as they went, the small little city didn't have, it should, it should have been a, an easy defeat. They lost the battle against Ai. And Joshua cried out, God, what is it? God, what is it? We, uh, we, uh, we've lost our strength. And God said, there's sin in your camp. There's somebody in your camp that has taken spoils out of my tithe. Because what's cursed in our hand, what's a blessing in God's hands can be a curse in our hands. We wonder why sometimes our money bags have holes in it or why we work in another job and working harder and harder to make it and we, and we realize a few months ago we've had a tough time so we didn't, we're not tithing. We're giving a little, we're giving a, giving a donation but we're not tithing and we wonder now why the finances are shut down, why our money bags have holes in it and why we're struggling. Now listen, we can break that by just saying, God, I'm gonna give to you what's yours and Lord, you're gonna anoint me and God, I thank you that I have the opportunity to serve you. Hallelujah. And yet Jericho was the first fruits of Canaan. So when Achan took the gold from Jericho, you know what he did? He robbed God. Will a man rob God? Answer it. Would a man rob God? Achan robbed God with the spoils in Jericho. Jericho was just simply, God said it belongs to me. Just like the tree in the garden, it belongs to me. God says what's mine is mine, is what's yours is yours. 
Why? Because he took the tithe. And when a tithe is in God's hands, it's a blessing. Uh, when it's in, uh, but when it's in our hands and it belongs to God, it becomes a curse. When we give God the tithe, in the act of obedience to his word, obedience is better than sacrifice. What's so important, Pastor? Why, why do you make such a big deal about this 10% of my finances? Because after all, if God needed my money, he owns all the cattle in Thousand Hills. He really doesn't need my finances if, if all the silver and gold belongs to him. No, we need to be obedient. That's what it is. It's an act of obedience so God can see our heart and say, God, if that's what you want, I don't care uh, whether it's needed or not needed or where it goes or where it don't go, I'm just going to give it because it's an act of obedience. Somebody with me? So in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, uh, there's uh, 10 things uh, that's instructed here. I'm going to give them to you again real quick because time's running out. Uh, first of all, bring all the tithe. All the tithe. It didn't say half. It didn't say a quarter. It didn't say give half the tithe to the church and send the other half to Brother Wonderful out there in nowhere land. <laughs> and Brother Wonderful's on television. He shines bright and he's all, he's all been all decorated up, you know, and he looks as cool as could be. So I think I love him. I'll send him some of my tithe money. Now listen, what you're doing is robbing God. Why? Because it's real clear where the tithe should go. It says bring all the tithe where? Into the storehouse. The storehouse is the place where we get fed. You're getting fed this morning. This is a feeding station. This is where we come and get, a, and, and, and get fed and we get built up and, 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 and we get the anointing of God and, and God challenges us and then we can go out and do great things. Amen? Amen. So where, where does the tithe come? To the storehouse. Why is that? Because it's in the local storehouse uh, that God will use the leadership and the pastor to minister our families uh, during a time of bereavement, uh, to uh, dedicate our children, uh, uh, to minister to our families when we're having family issues and, and pray in our children when they're wayward and, and, and stand together with us as a team and, and be there for us. It's the, it's the storehouse. That there may be food in the house. Food, food, spiritual food. Enough of God's house to meet all of our needs. That's what it means. Now try me now, God says. Try me now. God says, prove me and see if it won't. And number five, if I'll not open the windows of heaven, if I'll not open the blessings, if I'll not pour out the blessings that you can't contain, and then I'll rebuke the devourer. I'll rebuke the evil one. I'll rebuke the enemy. So many times we hear so many people saying, oh, you know, the devil's on my back. You know, Satan is on me again. Seems like I can't get over this, uh, this sickness because uh, the devil just has an infirmity on me. Uh, listen, uh, when we give to God, he rebukes the devourer. For what? For your sake and for his sake so that we will not destroy the fruits of the ground nor shall the vine fail or bear fruit uh, for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. Mickey and I... Uh, Mickey and I, I'm, I'm going I'm to make this short, but Mickey and I had the opportunity a few years ago to go to Alaska. Has anybody ever been to Alaska? All my Alaskan brethren, sisters. We went to Alaska on a cruise. And when we went to Alaska, we flew into Anchorage, Alaska. We flew into Anchorage, and if anybody been in Anchorage, uh, right downtown Anchorage, there's an information center there uh, that has all kind of grass on the roof, things growing out of the roof. I mean, it looks like, like a jungle on top of the roof of the information center. I thought that was just so cool. Things growing, you know, grass and flowers and everything. And we were standing there at the information center, and I uh, looked off, I guess it was, to the west or wherever. I looked down the road and through the trees and, 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 and down the main street, and way off in the distance, I saw a great big old mountain uh, that was higher than life, snow capped on top of the mountain, and it was just incredible. And... And I looked, I said, honey, look at that mountain. I said, that's exciting. And, and, and somebody, that, one of the local people stepped up to me and says, oh, yeah. I said, you enjoy that mountain? I said, yeah. I said, what is that? They said, that's Mount McKinley. And then they said, you know, Mount McKinley, hardly anybody sees that mountain. But this is a blessed day for you, they said. They said, because uh, once in a while, the fog will clear and the haze will lift and you can actually see Mount McKinley uh, from, Anchorage, Ohio, from, from a Anchorage, Alaska. I said, wow, that is awesome. And then they said, very few people get to see that. I said, wow. <laughs> I 
Isn't it interesting that God has an anointed mountain for you? Isn't it interesting that God has something for you to see that's beyond what everybody else can see? And the average person can't see it because the fog has moved in. And because and they can't see it because their eyes are blinded. And they can't see the blessings of God because they're so caught up in, in trying to struggle every day to make it. But I want you to know, my God will bring you through. Hallelujah. He's a God of more than enough. I'm looking through the fog and I'm seeing Mount McKinley. I'm seeing Jesus on the mountain. Hallelujah. And he's a God of more than enough. No matter what's going on around me, he's still on the mountain. How oh, would somebody give the Lord a big praise? <laughs> Hallelujah. Because the fog and the haze have been lifted. I want you to see some, I want you to see the mountain this morning, church. Don't see it through the eyes of, of, of the mundane. Don't do it, see it through the eyes of somebody that's struggling financially every day. Don't see it through the eyes of somebody that works two or three jobs just to make ends meet. I want you to see the mountain that God says, if you'll give to me, I'll pour out a blessing that you can't contain. I'll open up the windows of heaven for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Matthew 6 and verse 19 through 19. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Don't lay up yourself treasures on earth where the moths and the rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys or where thieves don't break in to steal. Oh, listen to this, verse 21. Listen, listen. For where the treasure is, for where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. I mentioned to you that 12% of Christians and Pentecostal uh, Christians are the tithers in churches today. And they did a survey and said the ones that's most unlikely to tithe is those under 25 and single adults who have never been married. The least to realize how important it is to give to God. If God has laid out such a great plan, why not take and reap the blessing? Just a question for you. If God has laid out such a great plan and we really believe that God's word is true and we really believe that God says, test me now and see if I won't, I will open up the winds of heaven if you'll be obedient to me. Why don't we just everybody jump into it? If it's working, then in 1 Corinthians in chapter 4, let a man so consider as servants of Christ and stewards of the ministries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewardship that one be found faithful. Amen. You're a steward of God's money. Not just 10%. We're a steward of the 90%. We need to be good stewards. We need to know how to handle our finances. We need to do it diligently. We need to make sure that we honor God in all that we do and get the best deals that you can and at the same time recognize that it belongs to God and I have to honor him. Who really wants to live under an open window? Who wants to live under an open window that the window is wide open, the blessings are flowing out, and God's going to bless you no matter what's going on in, in our society? How many of you really want the blessings of God in your life? I do. My hand's up. My hand's up. Then be a tither. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. 38. Give. And it will be given back to you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running over. It'll be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. How many of you believe what I said is something that really is necessary for us as the church to tune up and trust God? Trust God. Trust God. Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. I know this isn't the most popular message in the world, but God said that my people need to hear it. I hope you received it from love from your pastor. Not condemnation, not putting anybody down, not pointing the finger on anybody, just saying, I want you to be blessed. I found out a key. I found out what works. I found something that's working. I want you to, I want you to be able to look, quit looking into the fog and not seeing the glorious mountain of Mount McKinley, but I want you to see the glorious anointing of Jesus, uh, that he is there ready to give you a fresh vision uh, that other people aren't seeing. Evidently, the rest of the Christian world's not seeing it because they're not doing it. But it's for you, and it's for me. Maybe you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus as your own personal Savior. That's where it has to start. 
Maybe you've never asked Christ to come into your heart. I hope that before this morning's over, you would make that decision and say, Jesus, I need you, I need you, I need you. I ask you to come into my life and into my heart. How do I know, Pastor, whether I'm ready for heaven? How do I know? By answering this question, if you would die tonight, God forbid, but if you would, do you know your name's written in the Lamb's book of life? Do you know you got a home in heaven? Do you know Jesus is going to prepare a place just for you? You can know that this morning by simply allowing this pastor to pray a prayer with you that leads you to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here this morning, you used to serve God, you used to be strong in the things of God. He was excited about what I, when I would preach something like this, you'd be the one to shout amen and holler, but maybe the hurts and wounds and circumstances of life just taking the edge of joy off of it and you don't feel the excitement anymore. You can do like David did in Psalms 51, creating me a clean heart, O God. Restore within me the joy of my salvation. Take not your Holy Spirit from me, O God. If you need to make a, make a response to either one of those requests, either you need to ask Jesus to come into your heart or you need to ask the Lord to restore you back to where you used to be, it would be my privilege and honor to pray for you. Would you raise your hand right now and say, Pastor, that's me. Pastor, that's me. I see that hand. God bless you, brother. Somebody else by the uplifted hand. Say, Pastor, that's me. Is there somebody else? Somebody else. Say, I'm, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Coming home. God bless you. There's somebody else by the uplifted hand saying, me too. Just include me, Pastor. Might as well. Nothing to lose. I'm not asking you to join a church or join a program. I'm just asking you to let Jesus take over your life. That's all. Would you stand with me, please, everybody in the house? Hallelujah. Would the elders come to the altar? My brother raised your hand, but you just come. And... Brother Albert. Gerald's son in the military come back home now I'm going to let Jesus take over his life Amen. praise God hallelujah this is a great day Gerald great day I want you all to pray a prayer with Albert and me and then we're going to ask God to touch some of those that want the windows of heaven to be open for you Let's pray this prayer. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Make me whole. I confess Jesus Christ as Lord of my life. I acknowledge that God raised Christ from the dead. Lord, according to your word, I know that I'm saved, ready for heaven. Lord, I'm going to serve you I commit that to you right now. I'll serve you for the rest of my life. And I thank you that you got a home in heaven with, your, with my name on it because my name's in your book and I'll reign with you for eternity. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray right now for the baptism of the Holy Ghost of my brother. Fill him with the anointing of God. Let the Spirit of the Lord overshadow him. Jesus, you're the baptizer. Baptize him in the spirit with the power of the Holy Ghost and with your anointing. Let Albert feel the very touch of God this morning. He'll never be the same. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? If you have a need, come. We're going to be closing this service in a minute. We don't have a service tonight, so take a few minutes it's going to be all right now let me ask you this there's prayer going on i want a little room here if i could in the front this altar call is going to be start with me all the way to the back just fill the aisles you want you've got received something this morning and you want the spirit of god to dwell in you in a fresh way you want the windows of heaven to open this year like never before and you're willing to act you're willing to be obedient to God to bring it to about. I want you to step in this out. I'm going to pray for every person that wants the anointing of God. You want the windows of heaven open. You know there's a release and some finances necessary in your life and you want it. You need it and you know the key. 
the key is you be obedient to God he'll be and, and he'll open up the windows of heaven every person that needs this year you want this year to be your blessing year I want you to step in the aisle because when you make that step what you're saying is I'm going to be obedient to tithing when you step in this aisle you're saying because if you're not going to be obedient to that you're going to circumvent what God's trying to do when you step in this aisle you're saying I will be obedient to the tithe I'll give God his portion amen isn't that what we're saying hallelujah hallelujah and you're going to see the increase nobody can make you do this nobody said you have to someone said to me hey, years ago pastor do I have to tithe you know what I said no I get to I get to what a privilege I get to tithe amen and we're going to see the finance of this church come up we're going to see increase in this ministry and we're going to see the power of God sweep through here in a new way because we got some committed people are saying I'm going to give to the Lord Mickey I want you to come I want you to pray and then close this out I want you to pray every person here they can do it. hallelujah you heard the story you heard my story and I want you to know that everything I mean I'm one of these kind that I'm a number person and in numbers just didn't line up. But I'm going to tell you from the day that I was, first of all, I was obedient to my husband. All right, girls, listen to that one. When I was obedient to my husband, even though inside of me, I was thinking, this thing ain't going to work. It isn't going to work. But you see, I didn't know God like I know now. And I was ignorant. All right, I was just flat ignorant. But I had enough of God in me that I knew I had better trust Him. And the day that we started, I mean, the day that we started tithing, it, it changed our life. It turned our life around. And now, as He said, I mean, I'm not as extreme as the coupon. But I am anything that comes into that house, the tithe comes first. I don't care if it's one of those checks that come in. Hey, I don't know where did this thing come from. I don't care. God gets ten percent of it. Amen. And I want to see you just as blessed as Pastor and I are. We are blessed people. Amen. Blessed, blessed. Everything I put my hand on is blessed. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, I just come to you and I, I ask your blessing, first of all, on these people. God, I thank you as they have stepped out in faith, just as I did. As I stepped out in faith, I thank you, Lord, that they're stepping out in faith today. They're going to make a commitment. And that commitment is, God, that they're going to tithe first, right off the top. And after that, Lord God, they're, going to, they're, they're testing you. They're going to see what you're going to do. But God, you have always come through. And God, I just ask your blessing upon them as today some of them for the very first time are stepping out in faith and believing that you're going to take care of it. You're going to watch after it. But God, the other part of that too is that 90% that you've given us, we got to be good stewards of that and not be spending money more money than we should be spending. So, Father, we just thank you. We give you blessings. I ask your blessing again on all of these ones, Lord. And, God, as they test you, God, that you'll show yourself big and strong. And, God, that they will be such believers. They'll go out and tell everybody, tithe everything, including the coupons. So, Father, we give you praise and we give you honor. Father, tonight... Let the home fellowships be great, Lord God. Let us sign up and go around and visit people and be just a part of the body of Christ. So, God, we thank you. We give you praise and we give you honor in Jesus' name. And we all said, God bless you.
Hallelujah. Let's, let's worship with this song. There's something sitting on this song. Let's just do it right where you are for a second. One time. Change my heart, oh God. Because he has changed some hearts. Change my heart, oh God. Come on, church. Lift it up. Make me ever true. Change my heart, oh God. Let's pick it up. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Thank you, Lord. Change my heart, oh 